The Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. I extend a, a welcome, this congregation extends a welcome to each and every one of you who have worshiped for some time with us here in the sanctuary. And a special welcome to those of you who are visiting us from other places. Know that here, everyone is welcome. I hope you had a chance to download the bulletin or to follow it on the screen as it goes. I certainly invite you to be a participant, uh, not just an audience for this. Uh, join in the liturgy that's in bold and the responsive liturgy. Sing the hymn with us. May this be a service of worship that we share, that we share together. I do want to say a personal word of thanks to the fine staff that continues to work, each and every one of them. Our custodial staff continues to do deep cleaning all over the sanctuary, and will conti continue that, uh, certainly up to the time that we may return here together. Uh, I'm grateful to Tim Hall, our building supervisor, who is keeping us running I'm grateful to Donna Bai, our office administrator, and her colleague, Donna Rulon. Donna Bai has continued to keep our, the business side of, of our church going in faithful, very faithful and thorough ways. I'm grateful to Eric Gasteyer, our wonderful church musician, for the beautiful music, for his art of the organ that he brings to us, service in and service out. My colleagues, Amy Backstrom, Director of Family Ministries, and Rachel King, Director of Children's Music, continue to offer us wonderful um, things on our wonderful uh, pieces on our website and on our Facebook page. Grateful to every last one of them. And I thank you for the support that you still continue to register with us financially that enables us to keep going until we open the doors and all come in. At this time now, I invite you to prepare your hearts to worship God. Good morning. The organ music today comes from three French composers of the late 19th and early 20th century. They each held church positions in Paris uh, the first, Charles Marie Vidor at Saint Sulpice, Cesar Franck at Saint Clotilde, and Theodore Salome at La Trinite. Vidor has the additional distinction of being the founder of the American Conservatory at Fontainebleau. The American Conservatory became a mecca for American musicians and composers uh, who wished to study in Europe. And I'm grateful to be one of the hundreds of American organists who are the recipients of that great musical tradition through our own teachers. In my case, Donald R. M. Patterson.
you to join me in our call to worship. Come, bring your doubts, your hopes, your faith. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Alleluia. Come, bring your questions, your wonderings, your misgivings. Christ, Christ is, is risen. Alleluia. Come, bring your fear, your sorrow, your joy. Christ, Christ is risen. Alleluia. With, With thanksgiving, thanksgiving and praise, let us worship, worship our God. God. Let us pray. Come to us, O God. Open our locked doors and hearts. Dust us off and make us new. Lead us with all our questions and wonderings into the exciting mysteries of discipleship. We long to be your Easter people, to live and proclaim new life with all our being. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of confession. There are times, O oh God, when we hide behind locked doors, too fearful or preoccupied to venture outside of ourselves outside of our traditions and our own ideas. Too, Too often, we prefer to stay in familiar places, even if those places are gripped by gloom, self-pity, and fear. We are reluctant to dance with our questions or allow others the freedom of their doubts. We do not honor a holy skepticism. Like, like the, the disciples, disciples in the upper room, we hide. We, we cower in fear. We do not trust. Forgive us, gracious God. Set us free. As you broke open the tomb in the mystery of Easter morning, break the locks that keep us shut inside ourselves and take us into the new and uncertain dawn of resurrection. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. Whether we hear a voice from the heavens or a small voice in our hearts, listen carefully for the love of God. Receive God's love and live in God's freedom, for we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Hello families! We are back for another children's message and last week we had Easter and we know that Jesus rose from the dead, right? The tomb was empty and he is back and so this week we're going to be hearing about how Thomas doubted his friends when they said, did you see Jesus? He's back. And Thomas is like, mm, I don't think so because we saw him die. We know that he's dead and until I see the marks in his hands and his feet, and I see him walking around, I'm not going to believe that he's alive. And so sometimes we do have to have faith that Jesus is with us. And so Thomas ends up seeing Jesus, and we can't really see Jesus in our days, but we know that he's here. But sometimes we still doubt that he's with us. And so during this time of kind of weirdness, we're just at home and we miss our friends and we miss our grandparents and we kind of doubt sometimes that Jesus is with us because it's hard to be away from everybody. It's hard to do your schoolwork at home. And so I wanted to ask some of my friends, how do you know during this time that Jesus is still with us? So I asked some friends and they let us know how they feel Jesus even during this time when we're not sure what's going on. Feel the Holy Spirit in the flowers because Jesus is always with us. Jesus is always with us in difficult times because even when we're in quarantine, he's bringing us happiness and love. He's always with us no matter what, so why would this time be any different? Bye. Hi. Guys, I want to introduce my, my cousin, Max, and she. She is here right now. Paxton, can you wave at us? She's coming. Okay, and guys, she's can going you to help us? Can you guys tell me how we know that Jesus is always with us? Um, um, because he helps. He, he loves us and he helps us. Um, Okay, Wesley, do you have an answer? He's the son of God, and he loves everybody, including the bad. 
Um, and he helps people that are bad to be good. Is there anything else you guys want to share about how you know that God is always with us? Yes. God loves us and cares about us. He cares about all the people in the world, even the people that are being mean, and helps them to be good. Those are all great ways that we can feel Jesus during this time, and everybody feels it a little bit differently. So we hope that you're all staying safe and know that we are still praying for all of you. Let's close with a prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us this time to really hear what you're saying to us and feel your presence, even though sometimes we don't always know that you're with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear us now as we join the whole worldwide church in saying individually, but all together, with one voice, the prayer our Lord has given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning picks up where we left off on Easter Sunday. If you remember the opening of John chapter 20, we went with Mary in the early morning dark to the tomb and found the stone rolled away and Jesus missing. And as that uh, story continued, it turns out that Jesus shows up and greets Mary and tells her not to touch him but to go and tell the disciples, and he will meet them later. And so where we pick up in, in verse 19 today continues that story uh, that, that very evening. 
And it's interesting that the story, part of Mary, the story of Mary, uh, ends really on a joyful note. She uh, is received by Jesus, met by Jesus. And then come that evening, the joy seems to have gone. So let us start. Chapter 20, verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Gathered in our respectively distant, distant places this morning, I would assume that there are a number of us, myself included, who feel in good company with Thomas. There are some things that are hard to believe unless one sees them for oneself. Thomas the Doubter is the patron saint of the modern mind that says, show me the facts, demonstrate the proofs, because seeing is believing. Now, to be fair, Thomas was not the only doubting disciple. After abandoning Jesus on the night of his arrest and crucifixion, John's story tells us that the disciples huddled together in fear behind locked doors. Until Jesus came and stood among them, showed them his hands and his feet, all the disciples were doubting. But Thomas gets singled out, perhaps because he was absent on that first Easter evening when the others gathered. In John's story, John, uh, Thomas has already shown that he has a mind of his own. Earlier in chapter 11, when the disciples urged Jesus not to return to Judea because the religious authorities were trying to arrest him, Thomas had said, let us also go, that we may die with him. And after their last supper together, Jesus told the disciples to not be afraid, because he was going to prepare a place for them, and they knew where he was going. But Thomas blurted out, We do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? No doubt about it. Thomas had a mind of his own, and was not shy about speaking it. 
He would not just follow the crowd. Words were not enough for him. Simply believing was not enough for him. Thomas had no interest in second-hand religion. If he could not see it with his own eyes, if he could not touch it with his own hands, he would not believe it. Perhaps we should not judge Thomas too harshly. I think the church could use more Thomases, more people who will not settle for a second-hand religion, who will not simply say the right words or believe the right things, but people who want to see and touch holiness for themselves. When he came and stood among them that night a week later, Jesus could have immediately said to Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But instead, Jesus gave Thomas what he asked. He held out his hands, hands that had made mud out of clay and spittle to heal a blind man, hands that had washed the dusty, tired feet of his companions, hands that had blessed and broken fish and bread to feed a multitude. Jesus offered his wounded hands and pierced body and said, Come, touch and see and believe. For the true evidence of the risen Christ is not seen in the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. No, Christ is made known in the wounds which are the wounds of humanity, pain, betrayal, vulnerability, injustice, poverty, pandemic, death. And we are invited, we are urged to come, touch, and see. In the hurting and broken ones of the world, Jesus is embodied. A more contemporary disciple of Jesus has shown us what this looks like. The last years and death of Pope John Paul II were a dramatic witness to the truth of Christ's strength embodied in weakness. That great spiritual leader could have shielded his debilitating diseases from the world. Instead, John Paul lived the witness of his namesake. God's grace was made perfect in his weakness. Despite the pervasive triumphalism of our religion, the truth is that Christ comes to us, works in us and through us, mostly when we are broken. As one theologian has said, the good news of Jesus is always the place of engagement with the world. It is the place where the word becomes flesh, where you can see the marks in the side. Some years ago, in a world full of pain that resembles ours today, poet Kate McIlliga spoke to Thomas and to us all in the words of this poem. Put your hand, Thomas, on the crawling head of a child imprisoned on a cot in Romania. Place your finger, Thomas, on the list of those who have disappeared in Chile. Stroke the cheek, Thomas, of the little girl sold in prostitution in Thailand. Touch, Thomas, the gaping wounds of my world. Feel, Thomas, 
the, prime, the primal wound of my people. Reach out your hands, Thomas, and place them in the sides of the poor. Grasp my hands, Thomas, and believe. And to this poetic litany can be added the great suffering and sorrow and fear of COVID-19 raging across the globe. So, wherever and however we connect with people in pain throughout this broken world, we touch Jesus. But the Jesus we touch is not the one who lived and taught in Palestine long ago. The body of Christ is among us even now. Look to your left. Look to your right. Right there in your own living room. Remember those with whom we have worshipped together shopped with in the grocery store, worked with in our places of employment. Consider the countless strangers with their own stories that we do not know who have crossed our paths every day. And behold, the body of Christ. And having seen Christ in the bodies of others, we are called to be present for them in compassion and care and love, especially in times of hardship and pain and loss. For as Jesus told those gathered with him on his last night, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Amen. days of high anxiety, there is way more than enough suffering of lives and livelihoods, of pain, of loss. These things we know viscerally, we're living them 
And we are living them with everyone, with all humanity. Our story for today from John reminds us that it is right there in the anxiety and in the pain and hurt that we will find God, that we will meet God in Christ. God in Christ in one another. So as anxious as we feel, let us remember that promise. Let us claim the hope that yes, in the bulb there is a flower, in the cocoon a butterfly readies to spring free, that in the deep darkness Dawn will yet break. May you find comfort in holding on to these promises, to these hopes. We're all in this together. And as you leave this service today, Go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever. That you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always. And that together we are being empowered by Holy Spirit for loving service and faithful witness this and every day of our lives, distantly separated or not. And so may God's hope and peace joy and love abide with you always.